Thank you, Dean Nelly. Today I want you to pause and to look around this room. Today, in the shadows, literally, of Preston, Desishore, Lieber, Harbor, Thornwell, the Antillum, <laughs> John C. Calhoun, we come to honor another South Carolina statesman, a scholar and a citizen, Richard Theodore Greener. Born January 30th, 1844, in Philadelphia, Greener grew up in Boston, attended Oberlin and Phillips Academy before entering Harvard. While at Harvard, Greener studied history, political ethics, metaphysics, and won prizes for oratory, elocution, and composition. He graduated, as we know, with honors from Harvard in 1870, becoming Harvard's first known African American graduate. An acclaimed writer and public intellectual, he served as a teacher and administrator in Philadelphia, in Washington, D.C., and also as a journalist. In 1871, an admirer of Richard Greener said, quote, he is brilliant as an orator and accurate as a scholar. Greener undoubtedly knew that in 1868, African American leaders offered a redevised state constitution. He undoubtedly knew that in February of 1873, African Americans were appointed to serve on the Board of Trustees of the University of South Carolina. He undoubtedly knew that in July of 1873, the university was open to African Americans. He undoubtedly knew that many criticized this experiment as, quote, an egregious spot, one that caused degradation and ruin to this university. He undoubtedly knew that on October the 7th, 1873, Henry Hayne, the Secretary of State of South Carolina, enrolled in the medical school, prompting the resignation of white members of the faculty. He knew this. On October the 10th, he received a letter from the Board of Trustees asking of his interest to serve on the faculty of the university. On October the 14th, 1873, 140 years ago, yesterday, Richard T. Greener wrote a letter back to the chair of the board. He says the following, yours of the 10th instance asking whether I would accept the professorship of modern language in the State University is received. In reply, I would say that I have just commenced my law studies in the above office, and under ordinary circumstances, should be unwilling to interrupt them. But if the Board of Trustees think that I may be of any service to them in the new career of usefulness they are marking out for the university, I should feel honored by this election, and would endeavor to sustain, to the best of my ability, their efforts in maintaining the high character of the Honor University, October 14, 1873. Green arrived on campus in the middle of November of 1873. He was 29 years old, the youngest member of the faculty, the only African American member of the faculty. He taught metaphysics, logic, Greek, Latin, constitutional history. The governor of the time, Daniel Chamberlain, described him as a gentleman of varied attainments, cultivated and refined. Between May of 1875 and November of 1875, Richard Greener spent a great deal of time in this very building. In the summer of 1875, a visitor came and was given a tour by Greener. And this is what he said. I paid a visit to the South Carolina University today and was taken through the principal buildings by Professor R.T. Green. These buildings, although not in good repair, retain an ancient grammar and classical appearance, comporting with the institution of learning for within whose walls have come great statesmen. The most classic of all the buildings is the library. 
containing 30,000 volumes of rare, ancient, and valuable books of art, science, and literature. It is admirably arranged and under the present care of Professor Green, who, in the great love he has for dusty volumes containing the wisdom of the sages of the world, was driven to voluntarily assume the charge in the absence of an appointed library. While on the staff here, Greener enrolls in the university's law school in October of 1874. He receives a law degree on December 13, 1876. He is admitted to practice law on December 20, 1876. While doing this, he gives speeches around the state in support of the Republican Party here at Bethel Lady Church, the first Calvary Baptist Church. Mr. Mayor, in this fall of 1876, he campaigns for mayor of the city of Columbus. But he also, that very same year, goes for a Congress. He goes for a Congress to testify about the racial violence that he witnessed and experienced. Racial violence led in part by Brigadier General Martin Witherspoon Garrett, the brother of John Hillary Garrett, Garrett whose portrait behind me was dedicated at this university in 1963. The university closed on January, June 7, 1877 by a joint resolution of the General Assembly. Green returns to Washington to serve as Dean of the Law School at Howard University. He later serves in diplomatic roles under the administration of William McKinley, and later goes on to continue his work as a public intellectual. But I'd like to conclude by one of Greener's last visits to this campus. It was in November of 1907. He was called to speak at Allen University in Benedict College. But while here in town, he came over to his old homestead. He visited Lever College, and he came into this building. He wanted to see the collection one more time. But the librarian who saw him thought that he was a white person. And he pretended that he was a white person. Until a gentleman on a scale putting books on the shelf saw him and came down. He was another African American librarian whose name was Robert Perry. The students called him Literary Bob. He was custodian, but also a librarian. He knew exactly who the visitor was. He rushed to him and Green and whispered, no names. <laughs> no names. The librarian looked at Green and said, do you know him? He said, yes. I passed across years ago when I was doing research in this library. Greener then leaves Columbia and goes to Orangeburg. Within days, he opens the state newspaper. And the state newspaper writes about a famous Negro making an appearance, a reappearance, at the University of South Carolina. And apparently, literary Bob did not keep a secret. <laughs> <laughs> he was very proud of Greener and told the world. And today, you will have a greater understanding of why we are extremely proud of this path-breaking scholar on our campus. Thank you.